Thank you so much, Preete, and welcome everybody to this webinar. We're really excited to be able to bring this content to our school-age audiences. We know that children and families of all ages experience homelessness, and we're very excited that we can share, that our presenters can share this information with you today. I see that we have people from as far away as Hawaii joining us. And as Preete say, said, from looking at the map, we have representation from all across the country. So thank you so much for taking the time to join us today. I'd like to introduce our presenters now. We have joining us from Arkansas, Arlene Rose. She's the Assistant Director of Operations and Program Support at the Arkansas Department of Human Services Division of Child Care and Early Childhood Education. We also have Sarah Pontius, Outreach and Engagement Coordinator at Action for Children in Columbus, Ohio, and they'll both be sharing some insights on their outreach and uh, partnerships and work around reaching families experiencing homelessness. You've already met me, and I'm pleased to introduce my colleagues from two of our other national centers, Mary Beth Jackson, who's with the National Center on Child Care Subsidy Innovation and Accountability, and Rana Schaefer, who's with the Child Care State Capacity Building Center. NCASE is part of a national training and technical assistance system that's funded by the Early Childhood Development Department at the Administration for Children and Families. And this system supports states, territories, and tribes in implementing the Child Care and Development Fund, along with supporting Head Start programs. And as we know, families with children of all ages experience homelessness. And case is focused on school-aged children, ages 5 to 12. And we're really pleased to be able to share this information with our, our audiences that work with school age and with children across the continuum. The school age and out-of-school time field has a variety of terminology. So I'm just going to quickly share some definitions with you. School age refers to the age of the children served, ages 5 to 12, and that's to differentiate from infant, toddler, and preschool care. Out-of-school time refers to programming outside of the school day, including before and after school, summer, weekend, and it can be family or center-based child care. And our national center name is After School and Summer Enrichment, and we use this interchangeably with out-of-school time. Our objectives for today are to give our participants an opportunity to explore the requirements in the Child Care and Development Block Grant Act regarding service to families either experiencing or at risk for experiencing homelessness. Our state presenters are going to share some strategies to implement requirements, and we're also going to identify some resources that you can use when you go back to your work. So our agenda for today, we're going to share some data with you about, the, about school aged children experiencing homelessness and the impact on their learning. Then we're going to focus on new requirements with a poll, a sharing of some information from our presenters, and a reflection opportunity. This webinar is going to be very interactive. There will be multiple opportunities for you to engage in chat using various chat pods that Preetay will pop up for us. As she said, we do have a very large group participating today, so we will keep the phone lines muted, but you'll have an opportunity to contribute both in the chats and also you can type questions throughout in our chat box on the upper left, and we will address those as possible. We're going to hear about coordinating services from Arkansas and then have an opportunity to chat about how you're doing that share some information about state and local contacts, and the rest of our session will be focused on outreach. So we'll have state examples from Arkansas and Ohio, and we'll also have a chat around innovative strategies that you may be using. And now I'd like to pass this off to my colleague, Rana Schaefer, who's going to share with us some data to get us started. Rana?
And remember to press star six to unmute yourself if you're muted, Rana. Rana, we're still not hearing you. Okay, so while we're waiting for Rana to connect, I'm going to start talking about this data. All well, guests have coming? been unmuted. Can you hear me now, everyone? Yes, Rana, thank you. Well, I don't know what went on. I'm so sorry about that, everybody. Um, I am here, <laughs> and I am delighted to be here. So we are going to start off with a little bit of data to um, help us understand why it's so important um, to focus on uh, families and children experiencing homelessness. As you can see on this slide, Nearly 1.5 million school-age children experienced homelessness in 2014. You probably can't see this um, graph very well, so I'll interpret it for you a little bit. The light green area are children living in shelters. The darker green are those living in hotels or motels. The purple are those living in unsheltered areas, like um, parks, cars, et cetera. And the larger blue area are those who are doubled up. At the very top, you see a very small gray area, and those are um, ones who didn't. All guests have been muted. Mute off your line by pressing star six. Hi, this is Prete Washington with NCASE. I apologize for the technical interruption. Can our presenter, just as a reminder, to hit star six to unmute yourself. Thank you very much. Okay, I think I've got it now. Can you hear me now? Yes, there we go. Technology, when it works, I it's am, great. <laughs> I'm so sorry. All no right. worries. Sorry about that, everybody. Um, and a little more on the data are the impacts on learning. And those of you who are working directly with um, those children who are experiencing homelessness probably know this better than the data, but the data will really reinforce it. Um, as you can see here, 75% of homeless elementary school students performed below grade level in reading and in math. And 50% of children experiencing homelessness repeated one grade, 22% repeated multiple grades. They are four times more likely to show delayed development and twice as likely to have a learning disability. They're more likely to have acute health problems and more than 50% have problems with anxiety and depression. And again, I'm sure that those of you working directly with these children have seen this firsthand. So this just set the stage a little bit for why ACF and the Office of Child Care have found it so important that they've included some new regulations. And at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Mary Beth to talk about those. Mary Beth, we need you to press star six to unmute yourself. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great, great. Okay, sorry about that. Um, so before we get started with going over the new um, 
law and the rules pertaining to homelessness, we're going to conduct a quick test your knowledge poll. Don't worry, your responses will not be displayed, but rather the entire group's responses will be displayed collectively. So I'll give you a minute to look over the provided requirements and mark which ones you think are actually part of the law and or rule. Um, just a quick hint, there is, there is more than one answer, but not all of them are actually requirements in the law or rule. So I'll just get, it looks like we're getting a lot of responses here. Uh, looks like 83% uh, um, check that coordinating with agencies responsible for services to children experiencing homelessness is a requirement. Um, almost half of the group uh, checked that establishing grace periods to comply with enrollment requirements is part of this requirement. Um, another half collects the number of families um, experiencing the homelessness served. And then it looks like the uh, just co collectively the bottom two don't have as many um, check marks. Um, so Actually, the only one of all of these that is not covered in the law or rule is the very last one. Oh, I'm sorry, it's the second from the last one, and it's the requirement of use of grants and contracts to support services to children experiencing homelessness. That's actually not in the reauthorization law or in the final rule. However, it's not prohibited. So it's not meant to discourage because states do have flexibility to use grants and contracts to support children experiencing homelessness. It's just not actually a requirement in the law. So thank you, everyone, for participating in that. Um, now if OK. All right. So as part of the um, Child Care and Development Block Grant reauthorization, new language was included, which requires lead agencies to coordinate with agencies responsible for services to children experiencing homelessness. Furthermore, the reauthorization requires states to establish grace periods to comply with enrollment requirements. An example is around health and safety requirements. Realizing families and children experiencing homelessness may not have easy access to various forms, immunization schedules, etc., the law requires states to establish grace periods to give those families additional time to obtain the required documentation. Another new requirement added into the law is the collection of data on the number of families and children experiencing homelessness that are served through CCDS. Lead agencies are required to collect the numbers of families and children experiencing homelessness and furthermore report those numbers through the CCDF reporting system, which is the ACF 801. And the last requirement in the law outlines how lead agencies are to improve access for families experiencing homelessness by using funds to permit enrollment while documentation is obtained, to train providers and appropriate lead agency staff on identification and serving young children experiencing homelessness, and finally to provide outreach. To further narrow the CCDF reauthorization law requirements, the passing and adoption of the final rule, which occurred about a year ago, gives lead agencies even more specificity around the new law language. First, the final rule requires lead agencies to use the McKinney-Vento Act definition used by Head Start and the Department of Education. Prior to the rule being passed, states were grappling with the definition, which definition to use, as the McKinney-Vento definition was a tad different than the definition which is used by the state HUD agencies. The final rule also adds that lead agencies should prioritize services to children experiencing homelessness. Priority is not necessarily defined, so lead agencies have flexibility in determining ways in which families and children experiencing homelessness are prioritized. Before we move any further, I think it's important to mention the McKinney-Vento definition of homelessness and give a few more specifics around it. 
This defini definition is far-reaching, and it includes more children. It also proposes criteria which may not have been thought of without reading through the definition. Through this, through this definition, the term homeless children and youth means individuals who lack a fixed, regular, and adequate nighttime residence, and it includes anyone who is sharing the housing of other persons due to loss of housing, economic hardship, or a similar reason, are living in motels, hotels, trailer parks, or campgrounds due to lack of alternative accommodation. It includes anyone living in emergency or transitional shelters, are abandoned in hospitals, or are awaiting a foster care placement. It also includes children and youth who are living in, living in cars, parks, public spaces, abandoned buildings, substandard housing, bus or train stations, or similar settings, and migratory children who qualify as homeless through any of the circumstances mentioned prior. With this more comprehensive definition of homelessness, lead agencies should consider how they are identifying and defining families and children in this category, which would further ensure more accurate reporting of the numbers. So now that we've identified the requirements, take a moment to think about where your state is in meeting these requirements. We're not asking you to share this in a chat or anything, but suggesting that you just take a few notes to yourself. Things that you might want to think about are what systems are in place regarding grace periods in your state, um, data collection, identification of children and families who may be experiencing homelessness, and subsequently, if you're not aware of everything your state is doing, this might be your opportunity to jot some things down on what you would like to look into to see where your state is with this. So at this point, after you get a chance to write some stuff down, I'm going to turn it back over to Rana to discuss more about the requirements. Thank you, Mary Beth. Hopefully you can all hear me and I've got the technology right. Um, so we're not going to be able to take a deep dive into all of the requirements um, in today's webinar, but we are going to focus on just a couple. The first one we'll look at is the requirement to coordinate services to children experiencing homelessness. So let's think about why we need to coordinate and collaborate, because as we know, no single system can meet all the needs of young children and parents experiencing homelessness. We can't and we shouldn't go it alone. We need to partner with other agencies and programs in order to meet all of the diverse needs of families and children. Um, findings suggest that we can't meet all of the needs and cross-system collaboration is critical. Everyone who comes in contact with families experiencing or at risk for homelessness have a responsibility to do their part to ensure that children and families have access to high quality services and supports that they need. All child care for children of all ages and housing providers have complementary areas of expertise and access to different resources. And they can help families when they work together to achieve more robust range of positive outcomes. Successfully meeting the needs of families experiencing homelessness requires a cross-sector, collaborative, comprehensive approach based on relationships and partnerships between most local housing authorities and early childhood and school age providers. We know how important collaboration is in order to provide high quality services that utilize all the available resources in communities and states. This is no different. We also know that sometimes coordination collaboration is easier said than done. It's also difficult sometimes to know exactly who to partner with. At this time, I'm going to invite Arlene Rose to unmute herself, and hopefully she has a more success at doing that than I did, to share what they've been doing in Arkansas 
to collaborate with lots of different entities. Arlene? Can everyone hear me? Yes. Uh, I'm, re I'm really pleased to be able to share with you some of the things that we are doing in our state. I'm going to talk initially about some of the uh, outreach efforts that we have been engaging in and then move towards uh, some of the partnerships that we've been able to establish. Um, Arkansas has been involved in the work of addressing the needs of homeless individuals for a little while now, so we're really pleased that we've been able to do some things around this issue. We've noticed, as um, was indicated, that there are some challenges in the fact that we cannot serve everyone, but yet we see a lot of uh, opportunities for our program to network and develop other collaborative relationships with others who can help us do this work. Within our uh, divisions program, as it uh, relates to serving those children who receive CCDF funds, uh, one of the things that we were able to do was to alter the roles of our staff internally. And sometimes, altering the names of our staff really has helped us to make a better difference. They were once called program eligibility specialists, and now they're called family support specialists. So this sort of expands their role and their network so that they aren't just looking at income requirements, but they're looking at a broad range of programmatic and sort of case management roles. And we're, we're really tending to sort of finalize how that case management role can look. Uh, they provide assistance to families to help them become much more self-sufficient and working with our partners in a very collaborative way to try to utilize any available supports that are in place. This is to make referrals to resources that may be available within a certain county or within an area. So for several years, these staff have um, been required to provide outreach, community outreach, at least once a month to child care centers that may be of assistance um, to families who have experienced homelessness. And we've tended to target two areas of our states where we found that the needs for homeless populations have been the greatest. We have really wanted to sort of focus our efforts a lot more. So we tended to look at our central and northwest Arkansas areas of the state, and we've been able to hire bilingual, just a few bilingual staff, but they've been critical in helping us to provide good outreach into various areas of the state to help us communicate well with providers as well as to families. Within our Northwest Arkansas corner, we do have a large Hispanic population, and we also have a growing Marshallese population that we've yet to fully tap into, but we do see that as an opportunity for further collaborations as well. To ensure that we are present and in communication with shelters, we've been able to assign some of our family support specialists to those uh, homeless shelters so that they understand what child care needs are, what the application process might look like, and to try to ensure that we expedite timely and speedy enrollment of anyone who is experiencing homelessness. We're proud that our state has been able to focus more, uh, and certainly more recently, in developing these networks to ensure that uh, families are engaged, parents are engaged, uh, and that we are working with partners to engage that full network that's surrounding that child. Our newly designed team of uh, workers who deal with family engagement is really spearheaded by our program manager. So they work in concert with some of our partners who are not listed here, which is uh, some of our out-of-school time partners, our Head Start partners, to learn more about how to engage in discussions around the issue of homelessness and how to work more collaboratively with disparate population groups. 
uh, as I said, we know we can't serve everyone, but what we want to try to do is to take advantage of the community resources that are available, try to build capacity within some of our areas, and particularly those that are very sparsely served in order to offer child care assistance and to be able to network with those providers. As you can see in this particular slide, we have a lot of partnerships that we have um, uh, been able to develop over time. We have worked with these groups for a number of years. And to our advantage, Arkansas, as you know, is pretty small. Uh, we, we have very rural communities, and oftentimes our resources are extremely limited. So we come from that sort of limited partnership. Um, based on that, because being a very fairly small community, it's really allowed us to build critical networks, some very easily with some groups, and some maybe not so easily due to sometimes changes in staff. Uh, but on the most part, we engage these players over time, our Department of Education partners, our Child Care Aware partners, workforce services, um, and we have a variety, probably about uh, 25 contractors who deal with professional development that really help us to support those um, homeless shelters and child care providers that are serving the homeless population group. The partnerships within homeless shelters really um, stemmed from stimulus funding that our state received several years ago. But over time, we've been able to refocus and reemphasize the need for collaboration due to the Child Care and Development Funded Reauthorization Program. Um, as you can see, we do partner with a variety of groups, but I have to say that our liaisons with um, the Department of Education through the Homeless Liaison, our professional development contractors, um, and our homeless shelters, the ones that we have really tended to focus on are the ones that do provide a variety of comprehensive services, and they are at our highest level of quality. Many of them offer transitional housing, sometimes uh, long-term housing. Um, there are a couple of providers that we're working with that also have a child care center under their roof, which is a very high quality center. So we've been very fortunate in that respect. Um, we found in our state that it's extremely important to coordinate and extend our collaborative efforts. So we do try to offer child-centered services to our most vulnerable population groups, particularly those who have experienced those traumatic events like homelessness. Um, and to really support them in our highest quality centers. Again, we have very limited resources, so we do have to prioritize those within our state. That's why we're focused more within our central Arkansas area and in our northwest corner. We want to um, hopefully look at the McKinney-Vento definition of homelessness. That's sort of been our driver here. And that helps us to serve our population group for homelessness uh, very well. More recently, and I have to say this because my boss would get on me if I didn't, but uh, we've been really fortunate, even though this um, webinar is really geared toward uh, out of school time for school age youth, we've been able to look at the partnerships and collaborations that we have that have been offered through a recent Early Head Start Child Care Partnership grant so that we can build our capacity over time. So we are very fortunate to have that grant so that we could look at a more broad-based sort of collaborative opportunity with not only Head Start, Early Head Start, um, homeless groups, et cetera. So we've been just really pleased with how over time we've been able to do this work. Well, thank you so much, Arlene, for sharing the work about partnerships and collaboration in Arkansas. And I know you and I had an opportunity to have a conversation about some of the work that you have done in partnership 
with the school age network in your state as well. And uh, your, your focus on serving children and families across the age continuum is really helpful, I think, to, to hear about. I do have one question from um, one of the participants. She's interested in knowing if child care licensing is a part of the division of child, child care and early childhood education in your state, or if it's a separate Yes, we are, we've been really uh, fortunate here. Child care licensing is absolutely a part of our division. Great. Well, thank you so much. And now I think Ron is going to introduce an opportunity for participants to share some of the work that, that you've all been doing. Rana? Yes. And thank you so much, Arlene, for sharing that um, really comprehensive uh, way that you're collaborating. Um, okay, so now it's your turn. Um, we're going to have a chat room, a special chat room visible for you in just a moment where you can put in your ideas. Tell us, please, who have you or who could you collaborate with to provide services for families experiencing homelessness? And if you've had experience working with your McKinney-Vento liaison, please describe this experience. So you see the chat room in front of you and take a few minutes to put in your thoughts and ideas, please. And I will let you know that we are going to save these responses and send them out to all participants after this webinar so you'll be able to keep these wonderful ideas to follow up on. And I just want to say, as people are typing in, um, hello. That I was. Hello. Yeah. Hi. This is Connie at Lord Ruth, South Dakota Childcare. Lord Ruth, South Childcare. Hi. I can't get on. I can't um, um, hook up on the webinar on the computer for some reason. So I'm on phone. So I can't chat live. But well, I had we'd a love question. to hear your thoughts. All right. I had a question. I'm. I'm this. Um, assistant, but I don't do the application process, the lady does, but I always wanted to know, you know, because on our application, how do we know that they're homeless? Homelessness. I mean, you know, is there a question on the, should that so question? That, that's a really complicated question, um, <laughs> but <laughs> to try to answer it precisely, I would say that each state comes up with a, um, their eligibility requirements or the enrollment packet. And in that enrollment packet is a place for asking the question in a sensitive way that can really help families be able to respond so they don't feel judged, they don't feel like they're going to lose something by admitting the, that they're homelessness. Um, so there's, there's some guidance out there, and you'll see in the resources later, uh -huh. um, some places you can look to guidance to find out what those questions should be and how they can be asked. One oh, of the right. requirements is training for staff and doing exactly that. So I hope that's given you some things to think about. Yes. Um, okay, with the Head Start, because when we um, do get together and then I mean, homelessness is not brought up, you know what I mean? But the only way we hear, I mean, in other words of homelessness is um, when they do the application and they say, do we put everybody in the household? Um, just you and your family, we say, you know. Do we put everybody, um, you know, and then no, just put you and your children, you know, your Your family. So again, that's a, that's a great part of the training that we, that needs to happen for anybody who is doing the applications or assessing yes. eligibility. So it's all part of each program's application process all and the right. training that is that is important in that process. But all thank right. you so much for your question. Thank you, thank you. I'm listening. Thank you. Okay, great. Um, so I want to thank everybody who's put in some of their great ideas here. Um, there's so many different 
thoughts and ideas. And as I said, we are going to save all of these and send them back out to you. I'm not going to take the time to read through them right now. Um, but I want to thank everybody who has contributed to this. And I think in the interest of time, we will move on a little bit. And the last slide before I turn it back to Mary Beth is if you're not even sure who to reach out to in your state, we have a great resource with a link here that will help you know exactly who your local liaisons are in your state, and you can reach out to them. And now I'm going to turn it back to Mary Beth for the next uh, in-depth look at a requirement. So the next requirement for our discussion today is around outreach. And how do lead agencies improve access by using the funds to provide outreach? So listed on this slide are just a few examples of opportunities for outreach. These were actually extrapolated from um, the most recent state plans that states had submitted. So these are actual examples of what states reported that they did to provide outreach. So um, the first bullet is um, this state reported that agreements with agency offices that provide services to families experiencing homelessness, um, those agencies could be the TANF agency, the SNAP, WIC, Housing Authority, also CC r and r offices um, through their consumer education website also provide outreach to Head Start and Early Head Start programs. Um, one state reported that they developed flyers and trainings at establishments and programs in the community that are frequented, frequented, frequented by families experiencing homelessness. Food banks, soup kitchens, shelters, schools, coalitions, etc. So with that, we're actually going to go back to our guest state, our guest speakers, and hear more examples. So now Arlene Rose from Arkansas, we'll hear from her again, and she's going to share her state experiences around outreach. As I stated before, uh, in Arkansas, our outreach efforts really have centered around uh, working with families who, who have been homeless, but um, having our bilingual staff really work in concert with many of our child care centers. They, what we do is we, um, oh goodness, uh, we have worked um, as family support specialists to help um, identify any homeless families. We try to work with those shelters so that we can expedite uh, timely service delivery. And that's been a really critical component of what we do. We have staff who are assigned in those sites uh, in the homeless shelters, and these are again in those two areas of the state that we've been trying to focus in on. Those Shelters provide comprehensive services that really deal with the transitional housing piece. They have long-term housing. Sometimes under that same roof, they're able to offer workforce services to provide uh, a more stable environment for those families. So it's very, very comprehensive, some of the service delivery options that are available with the homeless shelters that we work with. Our internal staff do go out and, and conduct community outreach activities. Some of those outreach activities may be once a month to these homeless shelters, or they may consist of providing outreach to the um, child care centers within a given area so that they understand what our policies and procedures are around expedited service delivery for those who may be experiencing homelessness. 
again, we try to focus on those two specific areas of the state where we felt we had more capacity to provide uh, good resources and referrals, uh, both through liaisons with school-based programs, if needed, uh, through our Department of Education, uh, working with a variety of partners that we had listed before. And I can't overstate the fact that the partnerships and collaborations that we've had in our state have been extremely critical uh, in providing the best resources possible. With very limited resources, again, within our state, we have to just look at other opportunities uh, and other resources that we can utilize to help provide the most and the best care for the individuals who are receiving uh, the services. Um, we want to be able to tap in again, although we know that our outreach efforts may not be sufficient, because sometimes the more outreach you do, the more um, uh, requests for assistance you get. Uh, and that can be a double-edged sword. Uh, we want to know that we want our uh, homeless population to know that we are there to provide services as needed, but then we know that we have to work with other entities, be it Head Start, Early Head Start, our after-school network partners and others, so that we can expand the, the resource and collaborative network that's out there. So uh, again, I can't overstate the importance of networking and partnerships. You really have to build them, and we've been fortunate to have built these partnerships over time. The only uh, area that I can see in terms of uh, outreach that we struggle with sometimes is the fact that staff may change periodically. So you almost have to revisit all of the partners again from time to time to uh, ensure that they understand the resources that you can deliver to them and us understanding, again, the resources that they have so that we are coming at this from a very shared service delivery um, uh, opportunity. Arlene, thanks so much. As always, it's such a pleasure to hear about all the great work happening in Arkansas. And um, you all are doing a great job and appreciate you sharing that. And so next, we're going to hear from Sarah Pontius on the efforts occurring around outreach to families and children experiencing homelessness in Ohio. And I'll let Sarah share a little bit about her agency and the work they're doing. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for the opportunity to share with you today about the work we're doing with at-risk families experiencing homelessness here in Central Ohio. Um, I'm Sarah, and I am our Outreach and Engagement Coordinator here at Action for Children. Um, Action for Children is a child care resource and referral agency, and we have been serving um, the Central Ohio area for the last 45 years, um, focusing on empowering families, supporting child care providers um, through technical assistance, professional development, and increasing access to quality early learning experiences. Um, my work at Action for Children, I manage a team of four amazing ladies who provide information and, re and referral services. So they work one-on-one -on -one with families across our service delivery area who are looking for child care. Um, sometimes they're connecting with families on the phone, sometimes in email, sometimes out in communities in um, outreach events. Um, and we are working with them to you know, do the one-on-ones, link them to services, um, and help them find quality child care. Um, so one thing to kind of share about that, every interaction we have with a family is different. Sometimes we have a first-time mom who we may spend 30 minutes on the phone with going over all of her questions and concerns to make sure that she's feeling confident. And sometimes we have the rushed mom or dad who may be on their 15-minute break at work and they only have five minutes to talk to us. So we kind of have to tailor our experience to each one um, of those families a little bit differently. 
So I think one thing to share with you all today is that our main focus at Action for Children is not primarily on serving families experiencing homelessness, um, but it's, in, it's an important part for us to be involved in that conversation. Um, when we're working with families, we can't best serve them if we ignore one of the biggest challenges that some of them are experiencing. Um, so we try, and all of our staff here try and meet families where they are to be practical about what we can do and reach out to partners and collaborators when it's something outside of our niche. Um, that's why I'm really thankful that conversations like this are happening to make some more of those bridges and connections and ways that we can all work together because we certainly um, could not do that on our own. So to tell you a little bit about the small piece that we're playing here in Ohio to support families experiencing homelessness, um, we were invited a few years ago to attend a community resource fair with um, the YMCA of Central Ohio at their Van Buren Center. The Van Buren Center was newly opened a few years ago, and it's a really interesting model of a homeless shelter. It runs three separate programs all under the same roof. So there's a single, a single men's shelter, there's a single women's shelter, and then there's a family shelter all operating um, together and serving all of those different needs. So at these community resource fairs, Action for Children focused on informing clients about our free services to help families find and secure childcare, as well as highlighting some of our parenting classes. Um, as we continued to participate in those, staff at um, Van Buren realized that there was a really large part of their population who was missing out on um, some of the information that was being served because they were only doing them quarterly. And the average stay at this shelter is about 30 days. Um, so they ended up kind of changing their service model to um, kind of take a poll of when a new, a new group would come in of clients to see what those specific clients' needs were. So that way they could individually bring in community resources and do information centers to address the specific needs of the groups that were coming in. Um, and they found that a really large need, especially in the family shelter, was finding and securing childcare um, before you know, they can be approved for state funding um, for child care. They have to be working. So it's kind of this vicious cycle of you have to, you have, to have a job to get state funded child care, but you have to have child care in order to support having that job. So that's kind of where we came in and the role that we've been playing with Van Buren. So we now go monthly. Sometimes we go bi-monthly depending on the needs of the clients that are coming in, and we host one-on-one -on -one info sessions with clients. We do info sessions for group settings. Um, we talk about searching for childcare. We talk about each family's different needs around what they're looking for. Um, we can go over what free or reduced services might be available to them, and then how to go through the process of interviewing with a potential provider to make sure that the families are feeling confident about the choices that they're making. Um, and then through these info, session, info sessions, we've learned a lot from the clients that we've worked with at Van Buren um, over the last couple years. Their goals of finding safe, reliable childcare are the same as any family that we would work with, um, but we've learned that they have different barriers and we need to go about the same service in a different way when, when we're working with them to try and reduce or eliminate some of those barriers. Um, one of the biggest things that we've seen when, when we've been working with clients at the shelter is that transportation for their kids is a huge um, barrier for them to overcome. They may not have reliable transporta transportation for themselves. Their child's school may be nowhere near the shelter that they're staying at is. So getting kids to and from school or from school to a child care provider and then having that child care provider transport them back to the shelter um, is a big ask across the board and a big barrier. So our staff at Action for Children have worked to identify some child care providers who are willing um, to fill that gap and help families overcome that barrier. So we have several providers now who do transportation to and from the shelter um, so kids can be dropped off them after school and they will get them back to their parents at the shelter 
um, when mom or dad are done working for the day. And then kind of just a, a neat thing to share as a, an addition to that great service that those providers are stepping in and playing, there's also even been a few examples of those providers have offered mom or dad a job at the child care centers. Um, so it's really been neat to kind of see different parts of the community really wrapping around and supporting families there. Um, another challenge that we see um, is typically when we start a one-on-one -on -one conversation with a family who's looking for child care, one of the first questions that we would normally ask is, where do you live? What is your address? Because that's a natural place to start looking for child care. And that can be a really emotionally charged question to ask someone who is experiencing homelessness. It can be a really, really emotional for them. They may not know the answer or that answer might change from day to day. So we've really had to kind of change the way we've asked questions, change the way we're trying to get information from the families that we're working with to ensure that we can still find them the resources they need. But instead of, um, asking where do you live, it could be where would you like to look for child care or um, you know, if it's a school-aged child, where does your child go to school? Let's start looking for care around school because we know home might change pretty frequently, but it, at least it's less likely that school for that child is going to change as frequently as home might. Um, so those are just a few of the examples of the work that we've done, the barriers that we've found, and some of the ways that we have worked to kind of overcome or eliminate some of those. Um, so our work to support families experiencing homelessness, to me it doesn't seem particularly groundbreaking, but it's just a small piece that we've been able to do in our community um, to work together to try and take steps to make some change. So thanks for having me, and if you have any questions, I would be happy to answer those. Well, thank you so much, Sarah and Arlene. And as you were both sharing the strategies that you use, and specifically the, um, the training for your, um, your family support workers, your outreach workers, it really uh, resonated with the question that we had from our caller about um, how do you find out if families are experiencing homelessness. So um, I thought that your response, Sarah, about instead of asking the first question being, oh, well, where do you live, that there are different ways to think about it so that you're not making people uncomfortable and you're, you're finding another way to start the conversation. So I'm hoping that that's something that's helpful. I'm hoping that that's something that's helpful to others as they're thinking about those ways. And I think it becomes really clear that the, the training and preparation of your staff is such a crucial part of that. Obviously, partner, um, combined with your partnerships with these other organizations, I think you both emphasize that came through clearly in what both of you had to say about how you're doing this work and how this work is being accomplished. I don't think we have any questions right now from our participants, so um, let's just go on to our chat room activity, Mary Beth. I think we have a couple minutes to do that before we wrap up with the resources. Okay, great. Okay, so again, just to echo what Siobhan had mentioned, this has been such rich information. We've heard from the state level, we've heard from Arlene, and we've also heard from Sarah that shared some more community-based, localized efforts. So we have one final interactive activity for you today. Um, and with that, you, you can see in the chat box, there's a question, and it's think about what innovative strategies you have used or you're actually considering using to conduct outreach to families experiencing homelessness in your state. Um, and if you don't mind, please type those strategies in the chat box provided on the screen. We'll give you a few minutes to do that.
It looks like we have a lot of people typing at once, so uh, oh, now the, the responses are starting to pop up. That's great. Sometimes it takes a minute. Looks like Danielle Campbell had mentioned that they've worked with local homeless shelters and partnered with social workers on site to refer families. That's great outreach. It's really finding them where they are and working with them in their environment. Transitional housing, parent cafes. I like the bookmark idea, distributing to public schools, shelters, and other agencies, child care provider training. Rana posted about Project Homeless Connect resource days. These are lots of great ideas. Thank you for contributing. And hopefully the two speakers along with this activity is just as kind of heard you to think about, you know, some ideas that you may be able to do in your own area. Visit to local domestic violence shelters, assisting with child care resources in those, outreach resource events. So please continue to add to that. Um, these are some great outreach activities, and I believe we had mentioned earlier that we can um, I believe Siobhan had mentioned we can save these and, and send them out on request if needed um, because these are some great ideas. Uh, that's correct, Mary Beth. We actually are going to um, send these out to participants because of the rich information that we're getting that people will be, people probably don't have the chance to write all this down while they're looking at it and also our, our folks that are on the phone can't see all of this information right now, so we'll make sure that folks get this along with the presentation. Maybe what, Rana, maybe we, what we could do is let people keep typing here and then just talk a little bit quickly about the resource slides that we have because people can download those in the presentation because I don't want to shut off this conversation. Do you want to just go Great. ahead and talk a little bit about those? Great idea, Siobhan. So the next few slides. Um, in the presentation, and I hope if you haven't had a chance to download it, you will do that, um, are a, a number of resources that I think will help you in your efforts to provide services to families experiencing homelessness. Um, there is the connection to the state liaisons, but several other pieces of information that will give you some really good, sound ideas. Um, and I hope you have learned something here, and I hope it's something that you can use and you can go back to your state to really um, improve your services because we can all improve whatever it is we're doing. And I, again, want to just give my thanks to Arlene and um, Sarah for their great information. And I will turn it back to you, Siobhan. Oh, thanks so much, Rana. So actually, could we... Um, Preeta, could we just switch to the resource library slide quickly? I just want to show people um, who may not be familiar with one of the resources that NCASE offers that's on the Child Care Training and Technical Assistance website is the Out of School Time Resource Library. And um, this is a searchable database that has a number of resources relevant to out of school time. Some of them have been created by national centers for the Office of Child Care, such as ourselves, and many of them have been created by other organizations who are working in out of school time. So we encourage you to visit the resource library. We thank you all very much for participating today. If you would like to get in touch with us, you can reach us at this email address here, ncase at ECE. TTA.info, and I'm saying that for folks on the phone who weren't able to log in. And um, we would really appreciate it if you would take a couple of minutes to complete the evaluation that will pop up at the end of this webinar. 